If you're considering buying an R32, maybe a Mark IV, maybe a Mark V, it would definitely benefit you to hear from fellow owners such as myself as to what to expect. What are the good things about owning them? What are the bad things? What should you potentially even look for when it comes to picking the right one to buy? Well, I'm going to try and keep the video as concise as possible because there are 12 points that we're running through. Six are the greatest things about the car, six are the worst things about the car, at least in my experience, and also not necessarily from my own car, but certainly things I've heard about other R32s, which you need to know. So we're going to start off with the positive, and for reference, the blue R32, which you'll see in this video, is a modified version that I drove. It was the first R32 I'd ever driven. I gave it my Car of the Year award in Beards and Cars. Miltec exhaust, 350 horsepower supercharger, lowered rims, skirts, very nice car. Then, the silver one in the video is my own. It was a Japanese import, so it had the reduced road tax, had factory wingbacks, a Bluetooth touchscreen conversion, and a muffler delete, or muffler bypass, so a much deeper, thumpier, muscle car-esque kind of sound as far as that VR6 engine goes. So, with that out of the way, the first positive is more of an abstract one, but I believe it is worth saying. It's part of a dying breed. Cars like this simply aren't made anymore. Very big engine hot hatches aren't necessary. If you're just looking for performance and power, even a GTI can be tuned to be quicker anyway. So they're just not done anymore. You know, 1.6, two litre turbos these days is the norm. Back then you had Alpha GTAs, Ford Focus RSs, Clio V6s, Golf R32s, these big, meaty, beefy, talky hot hatches. It just isn't a thing anymore. So these really are part of a dying breed and you can tell the difference. Trust me, you can feel the difference. It really does feel like a different type of car, not just another hot hatch. So to me, that's that's a pretty nice thing about the car, and it's certainly one of the most appealing things. It's one of the reasons why I've referred to it as the muscle car of hot hatches. To move over to the not so good, this one is a nitpick, really, but it is definitely one that you'll notice in daily life. The lack of a cup holder in the front. Now I'm sure you can get inserts, clips, maybe things to fit in the door to have one, but it's curious to me, at least from my own experience in the one that I had, and I believe the one I drove as well, there's no real cup holders in the front. It might not seem to be a big deal, and for some of you it won't be, but it is worth calling out because it's a valid thing. When you're living with a car, that's the kind of things that you notice that you might not notice on a 10-15 minute test drive. To move back over to the positives though, you cannot talk about an R32 or frankly any VR6 engine without of course referencing the soundtrack. It's one of the biggest reasons to buy the car, and it does not disappoint. One of my favourite things about the R32, the 4s and the 5s like I had, is there's such a versatile sound. Whether you want it to be raspy and higher pitched, get a Miltec. If you want it to be deeper, gruffer, burblier like mine, then do a muffler delete. If you want it to just sound good anyway, but be kind of understated most of the time, leave it stock. And then you've got other options as well, like Baller, I believe, and various other exhausts. So it's such a versatile instrument, if you will, to make music with. And really what the R32 is best at is being a musical instrument with a steering wheel. Don't buy it for performance first, buy it for the character, the personality, and the sound, and then the performance is just a bonus. So the sound is definitely one of the best things about an R32, and thankfully, it's one of the things you can enjoy all the time without even needing to drive that quick. The next negative though for me is easily the most memorable of all six, and it's one which I have talked about before. I'm sure some people would disagree on this point, because you can buy these with a manual, and you can buy them with a Flappy Paddle DSG, which I had. One of the reasons why I love the DSG is because you've got essentially four different driving modes. You can put it in drive and have it normal, understated, and economical. I actually used to average 32 to the gallon out of mine. You can drop it into sport mode and it turns into a savage. You can click it over into tiptronic mode and have like a sequential feeling rally car experience and of course for maximum performance you can have the flappy paddle mode so it's got so many different types of driving whereas with a manual you've got a manual and that's it but my issue though is that the car really felt to me like it needed a seventh gear like i said i've talked about this before but in particular the golf r32 is such a fantastic daily driver hot hatch and a fantastic long distance hot hatch that those occasions are when you will notice the lack of a seventh gear the most because it gets up into sixth gear by the time you're doing 40 miles an hour if you leave it in drive so of course for efficiency that's great but for actual long-term efficiency, it feels like it's cruising at, say, 60 to 70 miles an hour at way higher revs than it needs to. 
like above two, two and a half thousand just isn't necessary. A seventh gear could have been super long, super low, down around 1500 RPM even, and you'd probably get 40, maybe 42, 43 to the gallon out of it on the motorway if you had that seventh gear. As it happens, it's not bad on economy for what it is, but I think a seventh gear really would have made a lot of difference. And I'm sure for the manual, people can uh, speak to that point as well. Some people will probably disagree, but it definitely feels more like a rally-based gearbox where it just gets through the gears so quickly more like the kind of thing you'd expect in maybe a GTI rather than an R32. The next good thing though is that the gearbox, although as I just said could do with a bit of an update, but the engine is fantastic when it comes to torque. Of course I'm a huge fan of torque, I talk about it a lot on the channel, in beards and cars especially. To me torque is great because unlike horsepower, you can use torque all the time. It comes in so low in the rev range, it's so useful, it's good for efficiency because the engine doesn't have to work as hard, it's good for that explosive launch off the line, although you have to be careful with that with certain vehicles like the Touareg V10s, ripping out drive shafts etc, but torque is great. It's just so instantly useful and the fact that it's a naturally aspirated engine, at least stock, means that the torque is just there straight away. Unlike your Civic Type R's, unlike your Clio 197's, unlike a wide variety, in fact the majority you could say of hot hatches, you really don't need to work the engine that hard to get a lot of torque response and that to me is great because it means that living with it rather than feeling like every day is a track day is very easy. You need to overtake someone, just drop a cog, the torque will just waft you along. It's great. For those who prefer that, you know, rev the nuts off of it kind of high-end stuff, well maybe go for a Civic Type R instead. Not that R32s are bad for top end, they sound like mini Maseratis, but the torque really is so notably different to other hot hatches on the market. The next downside though, and this is definitely one that I noticed from my experience, and I'm sure that any other owner who's had one and not been able to park it in a garage will attest to this as well, they are rust traps. The R32 has a couple of key locations where they definitely attract a lot of bubbling on the paint, and it happens very quickly. I'm talking a matter of months. Even if, as in my case, you apply quite a thick layer of grease to certain areas or even wax or whatever you want to use to prevent the water from getting in, in particular I noticed around the front corner by the hinge of the driver's door is a very common location, and in particular, unfortunately, the Volkswagen boot lid logo wherein water gathers behind the logo, around the bottom of it in particular, and in the case of mine it did start to bubble up the paint. So you will definitely need to keep an eye on that, and unfortunately it's a very, very common thing. I believe not just on R32s, but all Mark 5s. I'm sure for the Mark 4s there's probably different areas, so I can't really speak to that, but in particular for Mark 5s, it's a definite downside and it is one you'll need to keep on top of. It's not the most expensive thing in the world to get something like that touched up, depending on who your paint worker is, but it's still an inconvenience that really should be avoidable. The next great thing though, as Top Gear and Clarkson himself can attest to, is the handling. These cars are fantastic on handling. Now the caveat to that is, as I myself found out, they are very, very sensitive to their tracking. Even a relatively stock car like mine, the tracking was off, and it was off by a lot, and it was one of the scariest driving experiences I've ever had doing, say, 60 miles an hour on the motorway. It felt like the slightest adjustment of the steering wheel, I was going to spin out and crash, because the toe was so far out on the back wheels that it felt like a shopping trolley. Now, they are very reactive to that, so you will need to keep your tracking and alignment regularly updated to make sure it is good. When it is all set up properly though, these things are beasts. They're very front heavy though, so even with the all-wheel drive, which of course is not four-wheel drive all the time, it's only when it kicks in, so treat it more like a front-wheel drive car a lot of the time, basically front engine, front-wheel drive most of the time, front engine, all-wheel drive, very much front heavy as I said. You can feel that through corners, but they really do feel like these little brawler muscle cars again. Kind of like a really talky little rally car, but they also are quite heavy. I believe the curb weight on these is like over 1500 kilos, so they're very, very heavy hot hatches, partially because of the engine, partially because of, of course, the all wheel drive system. But yeah, the, the handling is still fantastic, and it's not necessarily fantastic in a way that it's going to beat everything or be the fastest around a track. I mean, it's great in terms of the engagement and the fun. It's such a fun car to drive through corners, and I mean, you have to experience it to fully 
definitely know what I'm talking about, but I'm sure something like a Focus ST or even a Mark V GTI would probably be more nimble through corners. But this is so engaging. There's so much character to the car and it's so much fun rather than just being concerned about being the fastest. And to me, I will always pick that because in the long run, it keeps you interested in the car for longer. The next thing is less in the case of my example, but something which you will definitely want to watch out for. One of the biggest initial problems with an R32 when it comes to buying one, ragged examples. So the R32, unfortunately, is one of those cars wherein you have such a, a wide swath between what you'll find on the market. You can find examples that are five, six grand more expensive, but they're in great condition. And there's a reason why they're so good. It'll be like an older driver who keeps it garaged all the time. It might have 20, 30,000 miles on it from 2006 and treated like an absolute gem, like a Clio V6 or something would be. But then you'll find one for five or six grand with 150,000 miles on it, a Miltec exhaust, a turbo maybe, and it's been absolutely ragged for its entire life. So there is such a broad spectrum with a car like this, more so than I would say maybe any other hot hatch. Most hot hatches tend to have a very specific pool of drivers. So like a Renault, they're usually a lot cheaper, they're usually ragged, usually tuned. Other vehicles like a Clio V6, you'll almost never find a ragged, heavily modified boy racer example. It's just not that kind of car. The R32 does span both, so picking the right one is more of a challenge. As a general rule, my recommendation is buy an R32 with as few modifications as you can find. If possible, get one from Japan, like I did, because of two things. One, Japanese petrol heads, I've said it before and I'll say it again, take fantastic care of their cars. It definitely showed in the case of mine, which was, if I recall correctly, I think a 70-something thousand mile car, but felt more like a 40, 30 thousand mile car. And because it's imported, at least for here in the UK, from Japan, it's about half the yearly road tax. So instead of what would have been £630 a year, it was 285 So a colossal difference in tax, and simply by getting one from Japan. And you can find one that's already over here, or you can find it from a specialist. Uh, ben Kayan, for example, the Kayan Motor Company is where I got mine. Picking the right one is definitely something that you need to look out for. If you start to see stuff like high mileage, a lot of modifications, a younger driver, I would be a bit more cautious of that, even if it seems to be a cheap or a good deal. There is usually a reason, a reason why. I would say about 10 to 12 grand is the region I would recommend looking in. Mine was about 11. So that's the kind of area that you should expect to find a good one in, at least for a Mark V, and these days even more for a Mark IV. Next up, we have a reason which kind of ties into what I said earlier, and I believe that these are very much ahead of the curve. In two ways, I believe that they would definitely ahead of their time when they came out. I mean, back around 2006 or so, this car had a DSG, all-wheel drive. You know, these are things which nowadays you'll much more commonly find, like Tiptronic, automatic, flappy paddle, etc. hot hatches with all-wheel drive systems. That's more of a modern thing. If you compare it to its rivals then, even stuff like the Clio V6 or the Alpha GTA or the Focus RS, there was no DSG version, no flappy paddle version of those, no all-wheel drive version. So the Golf was very much unique even then. The second meaning of what I'm saying by that is I believe that these are ahead of their time right now on the market financially. At least here in the UK, they're still very affordable, like less than half the price of the equivalent condition Focus RS Mark II, for example, about five, six times cheaper than a Clio V6 these days, if not more. So they are very much ahead of the collector's curve, and I really do believe it's a matter of time before R32s start to become, especially standard ones, a lot more expensive. I would say get an R32 while you can. Mark IVs have already started to go up. Mark Vs kind of are as well, but not as steeply. So very much ahead of the curve in both senses. The next problem, as I said, didn't apply to me, but you'll definitely want to look into this yourself, the tax. And of course, this is a country by country thing, but here in the UK, road tax on a car like this is very expensive. 630 plus pounds a year is the highest band it can be, which is kind of ridiculous given that my 2006 Golf would have been 600 pounds a year, 630, and yet my 2005 Bentley with a six liter engine and way more emissions was 340 a year. 
simply because it was pre-2006. I mean, tax is ridiculous when it comes to emissions, but it is something that you'll want to bear in mind. And yet again, another fantastic reason to get a Japanese import, in my opinion. And again, that will depend on where you are in the world. The final positive for me is that these are, simply put, fantastic all-round daily drivers. The only real qualm that I think many people would say about these from a daily driver perspective is that they're very thirsty on fuel. I got great economy out of mine, 32 to the gallon average easily, and I would occasionally put my foot down, occasionally put it into sport mode, and yet overall it was still more than good enough. And yet other people will say they even get single-figure economy. Well, sure, if you use the paddles all the time, if it's heavily modified, if you rag it everywhere or just leave it permanently in sport mode, I'm sure it's going to be thirsty. It is a 3.2 litre V6 with 250 horsepower and 2006 technology after all. But unless you really are driving it like a nutter all the time, I just don't see why the economy is going to be that bad. Maybe if you live in the middle of a city with start-stop traffic non-stop. I do think, though, that aside from that fuel economy, everything else, and even the economy, as I said in my case, it's a great hot hatch to live with. It's actually one of the relatively few hot hatches, which I would even go so far as to say is one of the best hot hatches to use as a daily driver. The fact that you can have it with that DSG automatic, the fact that it has all-weather four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive in the case of these, the fact that you can have it with five doors instead of three, the fact that the space is really good, that you can fold the back seats down and have great loading room, the fact that it is more comfortable than some other hot hatches, less of a track day toy and more of an on-road muscle car. These are just really good things when it comes to living with the car. Sure, a track day is fun, but not every day is a track day. Sometimes you just have to get some shopping or drive to work or take the family somewhere or go on a long distance trip. And those circumstances are where the R32 really sets itself apart, all the while looking great, having the wow factor from those who respect them and know what they are, and of course, a fantastic soundtrack. And last but definitely not least, we do have a downside that is worth noting because this is one of the things which I started to see a few times from ownership groups with GTIs and R32s, and it is something which needs to be said because of expectations. So a number of the things that I've said here were about how great they sound, how much personality and character it has, how much torque it has, but you'll notice I never really claimed that this was ballistically fast. Because by today's standards, 6.2, 6.4 seconds or so is no way near what a modern hot hatch can do. And even people who have modified them will often say that they find a Mark V GTI, for example, to have better tuning ability. Put a big turbo on a GTI, get it up around 350, 370 horses, and you can legitimately have a quicker car than an R32. So if you're just interested in performance, I would honestly say you would be better off getting something like an RS or a GTI and modifying it, maybe a VXR, whatever. This is not a car for people who want to just modify it or just have the fastest thing around. It's more than that. It is more of a cruiser, more of a daily, more of a, a talky muscle car cruiser long distance kind of approach rather than a Megan R26 track day monster, Civic Type R, Redline all the time kind of car. And I think that those people probably went in with the wrong expectations. So as long as you have those right expectations, and if that kind of burly cruiser is what you're looking for, then definitely look into one. Of course, my reviews, long term, short term, etc., and the exhaust videos for my R32 are still here on the channel, which you can find. And of course, I would love to hear the thoughts of those of you who are or were owners in the past. Maybe you're thinking about getting one, drop all of those down below. Maybe additional things that you think I missed, either positive or negative. And of course, if you are thinking about getting one, I hope you enjoy it. But until next time, I'll see you then with more. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.